Good evening and welcome to the Relationship Series of Virtual Conversation. We are reading from Job Title Worshiper, Understanding the Position of Worship Leader. We're on Chapter 5. And welcome to the Relationship Series of Virtual Conversation. We are reading from Job Title Worshiper, Understanding the Position of Worship Leader. We're on Chapter 5. And welcome to the Relationship Series of Virtual Conversation. We are reading from Job Title Worshiper, Understanding the Position of Worship Leader. Good evening. This is author Angela J. Poole, and we are here with the Relationship Series of Virtual Conversation. We are reading from Job Title Worshiper, Understanding the Position of Worship Leader, and we're on Chapter 5, Who is a Worshiper, the Levitical Priesthood? And I'm so excited today we'll be starting a series titled The 14 Characteristics of a Worship Leader, The 14 Characteristics of a worship leader. Today, we're going to be dealing with the very first um, three of those characteristics. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we bless you, we praise you, we honor you, and thank you because you are such an awesome God. We thank you, God, that you have called us to the Levitical priesthood and that you've empowered us to fulfill the purpose that you designed us for. We thank you even now for the gifts, the talents, the knowledge base, God, that you've given us to be able to operate in the role that you have assigned to our hands. We ask even now, God, as we walk through these characteristics, that we don't just see the men that David assigned to the assignment of doorkeepers, God, but we ask that you allow us to see the characteristics that are reflective of who you are and who you've designed us to be. We ask as we walk through these first three, God, that you teach us how to be who you've designed us to be. We thank you for the equipping. We thank you for the empowering. We thank you for the enlightenment, God, that allows us to line up with your purpose and your plan. We bless you and we praise you even now in Jesus' name. Amen. So the very first um, name that's part of this 14 um, part team that David has put together for his music ministry, which is the paradigm for um, working ministry that we're looking at, begins with the gentleman named Zechariah. Now, Zechariah's name means God has remembered. So let's read and see what job title worshiper tells us about Zechariah. Zechariah means God has remembered. Time and time again in scripture, we see that when God remembered someone, they conceived. In Genesis 30, verse 22, God remembered Rachel and she conceived. 1 Samuel 1, verses 19 and 20, God remembered Hannah and she conceived. Each of these women endured a period of barrenness that God used to perfect something within them. Once that process had been completed, they each conceived and bore children who fulfilled awesome things for the kingdom of God of God. A worship leader is someone who has been remembered by God. Their intimate relationship with him causes them to conceive and birth greatness. Their intimate relationship with him causes them to conceive and birth greatness. God remembered Rachel. Let's talk about Rachel for a few minutes. Rachel was the wife that Jacob worked seven years to marry, only to wake up on the uh, morning after the wedding to discover that he had been deceived. He thought he was marrying Rachel, but he actually married Leah. His love for Rachel was so great that this didn't deter him. He decided he'd work another seven years so that he could marry the woman that he really wanted, to be loved so much that a man would work 14 years to have you as his wife is a great compliment. 
And Rachel must have been extremely disappointed when she discovered that she was barren and unable to have children. Now, she was not the first wife. She was the second wife. Leah, on the other hand, the one who apparently had a lazy eye, she wasn't as attractive as her sister Rachel. Leah was able to give her husband son after son after son. How difficult it must have been for Rachel to stand on the sideline and watch her sister produce sons for her husband. The culture of that time was the children of Israel were looking for the Messiah. They were anticipating the birth of Jesus. So it was an honor when a woman gave birth to a son. It was a great thing that was celebrated when a woman gave birth to a son. Not being able to have children actually positioned a wife to be set aside. Jacob had the right by Jewish law to marry someone else if his wife was not able to produce an heir. That's how vital giving a son to the family was in that day. So Rachel's here having watched her sister be a wife to her husband, having watched her sister have son after son after son, knowing that she was barren. But God was working something. There came a point in time where Rachel, who probably felt forgotten, was remembered by God. And the Bible says that she conceives. The child that she gives birth to is Joseph. And we all know the story of Joseph and how ultimately he went through a betrayal. He went through bondage, but ultimately he not only saved his family in the midst of a famine, but he saved nations in the midst of famine. Rachel gave birth to a son who did great and mighty things for God when God remembered her. The second example from Job Title Worshipper is God remembered Hannah. Hannah was married to Elkanah, and Elkanah also had a second wife because Hannah was not able to produce an heir. So Hannah had the distinct displeasure of watching Penina have child after child after child when she herself was unable to conceive. There came a point in time in Hannah's life when God remembered her and when he remembered her, she conceived. The child that she conceived grew up to be Samuel the prophet who did great and mighty things for God. God has positioned you to birth greatness in the earth for him. God wants to birth greatness through you. There'll be times when you feel rejected. There'll be times when you feel set aside. There'll be times when you feel isolated and segregated, but God has an appointed time that he will remember you. And in that time, you will conceive and bring forth the greatness of God. God wants to birth greatness through you. And it's our responsibility to continue to believe what he said. It's our responsibility to continue to walk out what he told us to do, to be in the places that he's called us to be, to go to the places that he wants us to be, to do the things that he's designed for us to do so that the greatness that is within us can be birthed and be great in the earth for him. Zechariah means God has remembered. A worship leader is one who has been remembered by God and positioned by God to birth greatness in the earth for him. Let's go back to job title worshiper and take a look at the next characteristic of a worship leader. 
Ben means a son who is a builder of the family name. This denotes that there has not only been an intimate relationship, but that this relationship has matured over a period of time. This son wasn't just born into the family who received privileges and advantages of being a part of the family. He has grown to the point in his life where he is actively doing those things that enhance the reputation of his family. A worship leader is a son of God who through his own personal actions builds the reputation of God. Natural sons also tend to have traits, characteristics, and even features that have been passed on to them by their parents. You can look at some children and know who their parents are. You can watch their actions and see repeated behaviors. God created us in his image and his desire is that we look like him. 2 Corinthians 3.18 states, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Our number one priority is seeking our God. So our focus is continually on him. We begin the process of becoming what we see. As we mature, we begin to mirror the image of God. The more time we spend with God, the more he reveals of himself to us, and the more we begin to look like him. A worship leader looks and behaves like his father. A worship leader looks and behaves like his father, Ben. The name Ben means a son who is a builder of the family name. This name, this characteristic denotes relationship. The father-son relationship is a very important relationship in the life of any believer. When we accept Christ as our savior, we position ourselves to be the son of God, the sibling of Jesus. It is our relationship with God that is intimate. And in that intimacy, it matures us. In that intimacy, it builds us. In that intimacy, it shows us who God is. And it also shows us who we are in God. Because we accept God as our father, we recognize there are some traits that we're going to embrace. There are some traits that we're going to exhibit. There are some traits that we'll take on because we are like our father. The relationship that we have with God positions us to become like God. His character becomes our character. His truth becomes our truth. His mindset becomes our thought process. What God is directly influences who we become. A son is of his father. He looks like his father. He talks like his father. And he begins, once he matures, to build the reputation of his father. I remember when I had the opportunity to go to Greensboro to a conference one year. And because I have a daughter who lives in Greensboro, I checked with her to see what her schedule was. And I made arrangements for my friend and I to have a lunch with her at the end of the conference. We went to the Olive Garden. And it was so funny to me. My daughter came in after I did. I went in, got seated, went back to the car to get something. While I was at the car, my daughter entered the Olive Garden. The hostess was totally flabbergasted. She was like, wait a minute, I seated you already. And my daughter said, that wasn't me, that was my mom. At that point in time, even though we weren't dressed alike, we had the same hairdo that day. And the hostess literally thought she was seeing me again. My daughter looked so much like me to her 
that she literally thought it was me. My daughter gets that all the time. So she quickly told the hostess that it wasn't her that she'd seen it. It was my mom. It was her mom and that she knew where to go because I'd already um, contacted her and let her know where we were sitting. A son or daughter of God will look so much like God that when others look at us, they will literally see God. We have the opportunity to present God to people who will never go into a church building. We have the opportunity to present God to those who will never attend a worship service. We have the opportunity to present God to those who are in great darkness and living in great darkness. And if we've spent that intimate time consistently with him, if we've spent that time growing in him and becoming as him, people will look at us even in darkness and they'll see light. They'll look at us and they'll see our father. God's intention is for every worship leader to be so in relationship with God that we look and behave like him. God wants for people to look at us and see him. That's the second characteristic of a worship leader, Ben, a son who is a builder of the family name. We've all experienced a family member who brought shame to the family name, who discredited the family name, who disappointed the family with their behaviors. That's not what we want to do, and that's not what God intends for us to do. God wants us to enhance his reputation. God wants us to build his reputation. So when his name is called, someone will think of something that you did, something that I did, and we're like, yeah, that God that she serves, that God that he serves, that God that you serve is really awesome. And I know that because I've seen him through you. That's what God wants us to do, to build his reputation. Then a son who is a builder of the family name. Let's go back to job title worshiper and look at the third characteristic of a worship leader. Jaaziel means emboldened of God. This name comes from two Hebrew words. One word means to be obstinate, bold, or fierce. The other word means almighty strength, or power. We can conclude then that these two words when put together mean obstinate, obstinate, bold, or fierce in our stand with God-given strength or power. Simply put, we are godly bold. David supports this in his statement to Saul regarding the fate of Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 26 says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He approached an accomplished warrior who was dressed in battle array with only a slingshot and some stones. He heard the insults that were flung at him. And instead of cowering in fear, he declared the name of the living God that God would give him the victory. He prophesied that he would remove Goliath's head and feed his carcass to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field. He said it, then he did it. He felled Goliath with a stone from his slingshot and then beheaded him with his own sword. A worship leader knows the power of God and stands in boldness on the strength of God regardless of the circumstances. A worship leader knows the power of God and stands in boldness on the strength of God, regardless of the circumstances. David was truly a beautiful example 
of being emboldened of God. So let's take a closer look at David's godly boldness. David was a teenager. David had never been to war. David didn't even know what it was like to wear armor. When he stood up to the king and said, I'll take on your adversary, Saul gave him his armor so he could go out in his armor. And David said, I can't fight in this. I don't know this. I have to take what I know. So he goes to an enemy who stood head and shoulders above him. He goes to an enemy that's outfitted in fine battle array. He goes to an enemy who is skillful and expert at war. He goes to this enemy in boldness. The enemy looks at David and calls him a little dog. The enemy looks at David and says to the Israelites, why are you throwing sticks at me? He makes a mockery of David's approach because in his mind, this little boy has nothing on him. And he believes that because of his expertise, because of his size, because of his material things that he had um, for battle, that David in no way could contend with him. The one thing that he discounted was the God that David served. David stood in godly boldness and he said, I dealt with the lions and the bears when they attacked my father's sheep. Surely the God who was with me when I handled them is the same God that will be with me when I handle this giant. He can do nothing with the Lord that I serve. I stand in the name of God Almighty and this enemy shall fall. David, who had no experience, David, who had no battle array, David, who had no, no longevity at all in dealing with fighting, no skill sets at all in dealing with fighting. All he knew was that slingshot and God. He took what he knew. He stood boldly in the face of the enemy and he declared that not only would he defeat the enemy, but he would feed the enemy's carcass to the birds and the beasts. David was godly bold. He stood on what he knew about the God that he served. And he spoke boldly without fear, without confusion, without turmoil in his mind or heart, knowing that God was with him. So he faced an enemy that everyone else feared and ultimately in the name of the God that he served, did exactly what he prophesied. He knocked the giant out with a slingshot, with a rock from his slingshot, stood on that enemy, took the enemy's sword and cut off his head. David said it, then he did it. He operated in godly boldness. So the very first characteristics that we talked about today were Zechariah, Ben, and Jaaziel. Zechariah, God has remembered us. And because God has remembered us, he has conceived greatness within us. And the earth is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God for us to stand forth and give birth to the greatness that God has implanted within us. 
when we have an intimate and consistent relationship with God, we mature not only in that relationship with God, but we mature in our identity in God. We become more like him and we begin to do things that reflect his character. We begin to do things that build his reputation. We look like God and we behave like God. People can look at us and recognize the God who is our father because we are now taking on the image and the likeness of the God who is our father. Ben, a son who is a builder of the family name. And then our final characteristic for tonight, we are godly bold as we stand in his name. We are Jaaziel. We are emboldened by God. We are fierce in what we do. We are obstinate in what we do. We cannot be moved from the assignments of God, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the situation, regardless of the voices that are speaking contrary around us. We stand boldly on what God has said and we stand proudly in what God is doing and we allow the power of God to embolden us to do the will of God. Jaaziel, God has remembered us, we birth greatness. We have an intimate and mature relationship with God. So we build his reputation. And we build his reputation because we look like him, we behave like him, and we're godly bold in him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you ordained even before time for us to be remembered by you, for us to conceive by you, and for us to birth greatness in the earth for you. We thank you, God, that you've designed us to be Zechariah. We're thankful, God, that you're manifesting the Zechariah in each of us so that we're able to birth the greatness that you implanted within us by our time with you. Thank you for remembering us, God. Thank you for seeding into us, God. Thank you for positioning us in the earth to give birth to greatness. God, we're so thankful that you are the ultimate father. There's no father that's greater than you. We thank you, God, that you show us what a loving father is. You show us how a loving father does. And God, you position us to receive your unconditional love as your sons and daughters to look like you and to act like you. We thank you, God, for the assignment of building your name. And we quickly run to build your reputation. We thank you that you allow us to even stand in darkness, God, and allow your light in us to bring light to those who are in darkness. Thank you for allowing us to work in the earth and build your reputation. Thank you, God, for empowering the bin in all of us. God, we thank you that as we do what we do, we don't cower in fear. As we do what we do, God, we don't stand in confusion. As we do what we do, God, we stand godly bold because you have empowered us with your strength. So we stand with a fierceness. We stand with an obstinance that nothing shall deter us from what you've called us to do. Nothing shall deter us from what you've called us to say. Nothing shall deter us from what you've caused us to think, God, as we live, move, and have our being in you. We thank you 
that everything we need, God, you've already equipped and empowered us with so that we can complete your will your way. We bless you for your anointing, God, as we complete your agenda and we yield ourselves to you even now so that you're able to move about the earth, God, and make your light seen in great darkness. We thank you for dispelling darkness in every corner that you allow us to be in the place for you. We ask that as we stand, allowing your light to shine through us, God, that we push darkness further and further and further away as we bring you closer and closer to ourselves and to others. God bless you for Jaaziel, bless you for Ben, and bless you for Zechariah. We yield ourselves to those characteristics. In Jesus' name, we thank you as we pray. Amen. Whew. Job title worshiper, understanding the position of worship leader. Who is a worship leader? The Levitical priesthood. We're walking through the characteristics. Thank you for joining us. Blessings.